This morning I was uh, in prayer, talking to the Lord. And you know how Jesus said to his disciples, there are so many things I would like to tell you, but you're not ready. Well, in my case, it's a little bit different. So many things I would like to tell you, and I'm running out of time. <laughs> because I think you're ready. Because I think this, this world is ready now to, to actually see the great character manifestation of Jesus Christ and our Lord and Savior, and the character of God in His entire beauty. That we will not hide anything of His face, uh, anything of His good will towards man. So I just concluded this morning with the Lord. I said, okay, Lord, I've got two presentations left. You guide whatever in principle or whatever they need to hear. There's many more things still to cover, but you guide the major, th uh, the major things that they need to hear in these two last presentations, that the, the, the picture of yourself is nice and beautiful. Now, for those that are new to these presentations today, I'll strongly, I strongly advise you to get from the first one all the way. And uh, those that have been here all this time, they know what I'm talking about, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and for those that have been here from the beginning, I encourage you to get the messages and listen to them again. Because the devil has one thing and one thing only, is to distortionate the character of God. And he will do it in any means. And because we, are, we have this kind of uh, Alzheimer's inheritance in our minds, we will forget and it's only the reminder of his character that will take us through. People have asked me, Oscar, how can you be like that, the way you are? We're looking at your two daughters helping in the kitchen, and they are smiling. Have you, have you met my daughters when you've been? Yes. yes? Do they look like they just lost their beloved mother four months ago? No. You know, they are the testimony that my testimony is true. Because if you see my daughter like, uh, uh, like that, half depressed, you're thinking, okay, hold on, Oscar is faking it. But when you see my daughters, you go, man, that's real. Because it's not just on Oscar, it's on them. You've seen their smiles, right? Nice. Now, you know why we can go through this? Because what I presented in the seminars. When you realize that God is not against you, He's always for you, and His judgments are always good. And as Paul said to the church of the Thessalonians, he said, I am rejoicing in your trials and tribulations because they are the evidences that the judgments of God are judged towards you. Do you know why I lost my wife? Well, I, by the way, I didn't lose my wife. Do you know why my wife is sleeping? Because of the God's judgment. Oh, what do you mean? Yes, because his judgments are always good. And if he has determined that my wife has to fall asleep, I praise him because his judgments are always good. He is looking at the situation and he's judging the situation. And he goes, hold on a second. I'm going to put her to sleep. I'm going to give her a testimony. I'm going to bless that family. And that demon is going to regret the moment he touched this family. And he's starting to regret it now. When this video is well fire, he's going to regret it even more. Okay, so I'm running out of time. Might as well start, huh? <laughs> let's, let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, he's with us. Uh, Tremendous desire in my heart for you to make me a little nail on the wall, tiny, insignificant, and for you to hang a beautiful picture of yourself, that as those listening see it, they will be drawn to you. We pray all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. After the resurrection, Jesus was walking together with two disciples on the way of Emmaus, Emmaus, but they didn't recognize him. 
And all of a sudden, he opened the scriptures to them from Moses and all the prophets. He revealed the scriptures concerning whom? Himself. But what I mean by himself? By his character. He went there and said, um, you see there? I'm going to show you God's character in there. You see there? I'm going to show you God's character in there. And so far, we have actually gone through a number of occasions in which we've done that, correct? In this seminar. That's what it is. And you know what happened? The disciples started looking at the scripture in a total different boom, light. Because the light of the world, Jesus Christ, was now illuminating what? The Old Testament. Now, how many of you that have been gone through the series, all of a sudden you realize, oh, our hearts are on fire. Something is burning within me. We are seeing God in a light. Yes or not? Yes. Okay. So, in the sign of H, it says that rebellion was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His authority rests upon goodness, mercy, and love. And sometimes Hollywood has lied to us, friends. Because <clears throat> during, Holly, uh, dur during a movie, a Western movie, a classical. We're not going to go into all the stuff of today. We're just going to go into a classical, classical movie. A nice Western movie. You know, the Westerns, you know? The spaghetti Westerns. You got the bad guy. And the bad guy is very, very, very bad. And he's doing very, very bad things. And everybody is like, ooh. And then he's the good guy. And the good guy is going to do something to the bad guy. So all you know, it seems like there's a little bit of a struggle. But just the last things, you know, the good guy goes and, and leaves the, the, the salon. He gets into a horse. It's not his horse. He just... Stole the horse. But that's all right. Because he's the good guy. And at the end of the day, he's running after the bad guy, right? And in order to restore good, a little bit of evil, it's okay. So he runs and 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 starts shooting at this guy. And everybody in the movies are like, yes, yes, cheer him up. He's about to kill him. But he deserves it. So the bad guy escapes. So now the good guy with all the good guys trying to actually uh, generate like a trap. A trap on him. You know, like, okay, if we get him to get to that place and we deceive him to do this. And then he will go there. And under our deception, he will get there and then we'll get him. Now it's just pure deception and, and they're manipulating the situation. But look, he's the good guy. And sometimes, and, we, and when he finally kills the bad guy, we, everybody's cheering up, despite the fact that he used evil to get it. And we think that God acts the same way. God is God, and he changes not. Okay. There can be no more conclusive evidence that we possess the spirit of Satan than the disposition to hurt and destroy those who do not appreciate our work and who act contrary to our ideas. So if somebody is acting contrary to God's ideas and he does not appreciate God's work and God now uses hurting and destruction towards them, what kind of a spirit is God? The spirit of Satan. Man. Did you catch that? Careful, because God is not bipolar. Careful, because God is not Satan. The Lord had never commanded them to go up to fight. It was His purpose that they should gain the land, but warfare, but by strict obedience to His command. We saw this in the previous program how they left Egypt with no swords. The Lord delivered them through this Red Sea, and we actually explained to you what that meant. How many of you were excited with, with, the, with, with all those angels holding the waters? It was just amazing, isn't it? 
And then all of a sudden, they grabbed the swords. Where did they gra grab the swords from? From the, from the residue of the Egyptians washed to the shore. How did they gain the land? By the sword. Question, how did they lose the land? By the sword. And that becomes the human tragedy. Not the, not the history of God through a people. But the, but, but the history of a rebellious people. With a God that is still was with them pleading. And trying to get them out of trouble. Because he's long suffering. Okay. So. The Lord. This, this message today is called Trumpets. And the wrath of God. I want you to notice something. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and you shall remember before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. These guys are now loaded, loaded with guns, loaded with swords. God is still like, uh, I've got a blueprint. You try. Can you just give me a chance? Can you experiment? They go to the land and the closer that you get through it is, you know, when they go around the trumpets to around Jericho. Friends, when the walls came down, what did they do? They entered into Jericho and slew everybody. And God said, ah, oh, there you go. They were going well. They were going well, and now there you go. But God is not losing his patience. He's long suffering and said, Can you give me a chance? Can you give me a chance? And you know, he finds the chance on this fella, Gideon. It's called the Gideon exper Experiment. So Gideon is living in an Israel, Israel that is being regained and lost again by the sword. And the Midianites are actually in the land. Uh, is moved by God to get rid of the idols in Israel. And now there is 100,000 Gideonites against Israel. And Gideon does this uh, advertising campaign and he gets 10,000. Not bad. One of you for 10 of them. Not bad. So he said, all right, well, the Lord is mighty. The Lord is mighty. The Lord can do this. I mean, it's 1 to 10, but the Lord can do it. He convinced himself the Lord can do it. And the Lord says, I said, just make an announcement. Yes, Lord. You want to encourage the people. Just make an announcement. You want to tell them that you're with them. Said, the announcement is this. If anybody is fearful, let them stay home. I said, oh, you've got to be. Now, would you be fearful if you just learned that the others are 100,000 and, and you start counting? And say, Hold on a second. Are we all only 10,000 here? 10,000 farmers here? And they are the warriors of the Midianites? And Gideon said, no way. I'm not saying that one. I'm just wondering, you know, if... if <laughs> this is just pure speculation, of course. Um, just a way of, of retelling the story. Uh, you can read it, by the way, in Judges 6 and 7. I'm just wondering, you know, if the 10,000 <laughs> were there, and Gideon just closes his eyes. So, okay, guys, got a message from the Lord. Um, if you are fearful, you're welcome to go home. And the only thing that Gideon hears is this. Uh, and he opens one eye. <laughs> oh, no, man. I knew it. I knew it. You know, so he, he recovers, you know, when you got such a blow, you know, you, you need like, you need to wrestle with the Lord overnight, lose your sleep, you know, in the morning. Okay, Lord, you're still able? You're still able. I said, okay. I got an announcement to you. You're going to keep an eye. When they heading towards the enemy, they're going to drink from, uh, from the water. The ones that are ready, you know, like they, they're just ready. They grab the water like this. They're ready. They're looking at where they're heading. They've got their mind set in there. 
you keep those ones. The ones that arrive to the water, and then you go, oh, boom, boom. they collapse, and they drink like a dog, you know, like, boom. like they're tired, and the war hasn't even started. They're like, oh, oh man, the backpack is too heavy, you know. Those ones, don't need them. So I don't know to whom did Gideon pray that night, but I'm sure he was praying, let everyone drink the water like this. <laughs> let everyone drink the water like this. And all of a sudden, the majority just, boom, collapsed. And said, oh, man, we already defeated before we even started. And Gideon goes, okay. You, 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 and the rest of all you, go home. So the, he was left with how many? 300. 300. <laughs> it gets worse. Okay, my army should be equipped. Huh. About time, Lord. About time. You're going to get a pot, clay pot. You're going to get a torch. And you get to get a trumpet. You know, Lord, Abraham, you spoke to Abraham like face to face. I'm just wondering if there's any problem with the Wi-Fi at the moment, because I never heard anything about swords and spears and shields and anything of that nature. You know what, Gideon? You are part of an experiment. So he gets a pot, and, re and he gets pots and gives it to everybody. Can you see the, the faces of the, of the soldiers? Okay. And a torch and a trumpet. And the Lord says, put yourself around the hill. And when I tell you, you break the pot, you illuminate the shine, the, the, the sunshine of the light, and you blow the trumpet. And that's it. Now, we know the story, but... but it is the most ridiculous thing and the human understanding that you can actually think of. Do you know? It's like, it's like MacGyver going against a, a whole uh, army of, um, uh, of Russians with a chewing gum. <laughs> okay. So Judges 7.20 says... And three, three, three com and, and three companies blew the trumpet. So he separated them in three companies. A hundred, a hundred, a hundred. Three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitches, the pictures, and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hand to blow, uh, to, to blow without. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. That was it. It was in the middle of the night. Question, before I give you the answer. Question. Who killed the Midianites? They kill themselves. When we reject the Lord, it is suicidal. Did you get that? When we reject the Lord, is suicidal. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord said, Every man sore against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. And the host fled to Beshista and Serafat, and to the border of Abelmohorlat, and to Tobat. They kill each other. And Gabriel says to God, there you go. Hopefully, hopefully, they see in the experiment. They see in that with this experiment, we live it like that, we're explaining the whole great controversy and the character of God. And then Gabriel goes, oh no, what is he doing? What is he doing? Gideon, stop. Because what did he do? Then he goes, he sees that everybody is killed, he grabs the swords and he starts running after, after, the, after the rest that run away. There you go. Almost there. So, now we got another experiment. We got the, the, um, the Jehoshaphat experiment. So 
So Jehoshaphat, it came, then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side, uh, on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Asasotamar. By the way, the places in heaven are going to be much easier than that one. <laughs> Which is Engedi. And the three kingdoms were Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seri. Three kingdoms against Israel. Three. Okay? Three kingdoms against Israel. Oh, a prophet came unto the king and said, um, and, and the king, uh, sorry, the king actually presented himself before the Lord and he exalted the Lord to a point in which God saw in Jehoshaphat, oh, hold on, he's ready. He's ready. Hey, he's ready to try it out. And he says, if when evil cometh upon us, he's reminding the, the, the Lord, as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, will stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee and our, in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. So Jehoshaphat is going, I'm going to God. And while he's going to God, a, a, the Lord gives a prophet a message. And the Lord, through that prophet, says to Jehoshaphat, You shall not need to fight. And in this battle, set yourself, stand ye still. What does that sound like? Like when they were, they were about to leave Egypt? See, it's another try. The Lord is still merciful. He wants to try it again. You don't need to fight it. You just sit still and see the redemption of the Lord. And he says, And see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for, for to tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. You don't need to fight it. Just go out. Okay. So Jehoshaphat is all pumped up. The Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. So the prophet keeps on talking. And, talking. and he says, And they arose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of the Koah. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, the Lord your God. She, so shall you be established. Believe his prophet, so you shall prosper. Is he pumped up? He is. He's ready. He's ready to go. And then they consult about themselves. They consult with this prophet and what is the will of the Lord. And says the following. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord. And that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before or against the army. And to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Can you imagine initially, you know, when the Lord is telling Jehoshaphat, either to the prophet or what else? Okay. Trumpets. Trumpets. Okay, Lord. We're ready. Trumpets. And how do you want us to tackle this? You know, marching. Okay, marching. Yes. And uh, what else? Sing praises. Okay, I'm getting you. Now, just a reminder, Lord. We got Ammon, we got Moab, and we got Mount Seir over there. Yes. So God is saying, what, you want me to tell you the hymn numbers? <laughs> Sing praises to the Lord. Take him at his word. It's not that you ought to believe in God. You need to believe in God. And Jehoshaphat goes, Father, if we perish, we perish. I will live by your word, by everything that comes and proceeds from your mouth. Trumpets for everybody. Let's go to sing songs and praises. Well, well, well. And when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, said the, the Lord said ambushment. That word ambushment means the Lord made a delayed or was waiting or made it wait. Made it wait to whom? To the three, three that they were actually waiting. And against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. These guys are getting impatient. Which were come against Judah and they were smitten. How were they smitten? Well, for the children of Ammon, 
and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir. So there was two of them got together and killed the man of Seir uh, uh, people. Actually to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. And when Judah came towards, as they are arrived, and when Judah came towards to watch uh, to the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. Question: How did they? How did they die? They killed each other. Because when you reject the Lord, that is suicidal. You know, I remember in 1991, I was heading, I was heading, heading to, to high school. And I heard that the, the, the Iraq war started. And they were giving all the details of the Iraq war. And one of the details that really stood, my, stood in my mind was the fact that in their helmets, the American soldiers, in their helmets, they had heavy rock music as they were going into battle, inside the tanks, inside the battlefield, etc. They have like this horrible mu music that... Can you imagine if somebody, you know, the DJ goes and said, I wonder what this is. It. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, Goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And somebody is about to shoot somebody. And you go, sorry, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> Friends, there was a reason why that music had to be inside those helmets. Because they needed to get stirred up. And if you have set your mind to kill another human being, you are either demon uh, uh, harassed or demon possessed. And this actually, what happened is that in this delay that the Lord created, they kind of like, mm, they, they having, I don't know what kind of rock music they had back then. You know, they probably had the... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Whatever it was, but they just getting stirred up. They're getting stirred up. They got the thirst for blood. Can they touch now Israel? No, because the mercy of the Lord is around Israel. They can't touch Israel. The demons now, they can't get in. And now what are they going to do? <clears throat> How are you going? I said, oh, I'm getting ready. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. Well, I'll tell you what, man. You know, I can't wait either. I said, well, Stop pushing me now. Oh, I hope Israel comes soon because uh, you know, hey, stop pushing me. And they need to release that much testosterone, that much adrenaline, and that much demonish, demonish, demonish influence. They kill each other, friends. They kill each other. Look what the Old Testament says about the Lamb. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. You have seen me, Jesus said, you have seen the Father. He had done how much violence? Not violence. And was he showing whom? Was he, what, who was he showing? The Father. Does God destroy, yes or no? Yes. The Bible is very clear. How does he destroy, however? What is the Bible definition of God destroying in the Scriptures? By removing himself. By allowing those people to reap the consequences of whatever they've done. Okay. Listen to this one. In this age, a more than common content is shown to God. Many have well nigh passed the boundary of mercy. The boundary of what? Of mercy. The boundary, the boundary of protection. When you look at mercy in the scriptures, they're always in the context, context of God's protection. The boundary of mercy is, is being passed. Is being, is cro they're crossing that boundary. They are actually stepping out of the what? Of the boundary of protection of 
God, who is outside like a lion ready to devour. Who is the one that has the spirit of war and destruction? Who is the, destroy, the destroyer? Satan. Many are passing the boundary of mercy. Soon God will show that he is indeed the living God. He will say to the angels, listen, no longer come back Satan in his efforts to what? To destroy. Let him work out his malignancy upon the children of disobedience for the cup of their iniquity is full. I will no longer interfere to prevent the destroyer from doing his work. Raise your hand if you think that this is fully clear. Okay, raise your hand if you think that that actually is in line with the life, ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, and everything that he actually did. That's in line, right? Then, don't get into the Old Testament in darkness. Get the light and make everything else be having the scrutiny of the light and not vice versa. Don't get a, a verse that you're struggling with Rule the character of God. Rule the character of Christ. Rule the statements that are plainly blessed are the peacemakers. Are you understand what I'm saying? Okay. I'm going to tell you a story. Fire from heaven. What does that mean? First of all, heaven, in English... It means three things. In Spanish, we have different words for it. Heaven means heaven. The environment in this room, together with the environment there where the, where the birds are flying, that's heaven. Heaven is where the stars and the moon and sun are held together. That's heaven. And heaven is where the throne of God is. Paul calls it the third heaven. So, sure enough, you know, first heaven, second heaven, third heaven. When he says from heaven, he's saying from the sky. Are you understanding that? It's fire from the sky fell on the people. Okay. Jesus said, how do you read it? He said to this, to this lawyer, you know, what does, what does the law say? What does the Torah say? What does the Old Testament say? And then he adds, how do you read it? I want you to notice something. Because when Jesus is talking to the two disciples on the, on the road of Emmaus, he's showing himself in the Old Testament. But there are enough evidences in the New Testament that they should have, should have understood before that. Because he actually said, oh, you that are hard to understand. I've been with you three and a half years haven't you seen me doing things? Haven't you seen me saying things? So in Luke chapter 9, there's this story. I want you to notice the elements of this story. This is Luke chapter 9. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his, fa his face to go to Jerusalem. This is Jesus. You know, the time of his crucifixion was drawing near, and he set his face to Jerusalem. On the way to Jerusalem from up, the north, uh, up north of Israel, you need to cross through Samaria. And, and Jesus doesn't have a problem crossing through Samaria. So he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritan, Samaritans to make ready for him. Now, Jesus sent to a village in Samaria, in Samaria what? What did he send? Messengers before him to prepare them for him but notice what this village in samaria did and they did not receive him because his face was as though he will go to jerusalem so be the dummy say, oh you don't you're going to jerusalem you're going with the jews you really don't you don't love us they are rejected they didn't want him to come so because jesus was not allowed to come and when his disciple James and John saw this, they said, "Lord, will thou, will thou that we, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did?" So the two disciples are looking at this situation. Jesus is sending messengers. The messengers are coming back and say they don't want you. 
when John and James see that, they say, ah, that reminds me of another story. Do you want us to call for fire from the sky and burn them up? And you know what Jesus said? You have not an idea. You, don't, you know not what made of a spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And they went to another village. You see, you ought not to have a problem with Sodom and Gomorrah. If you don't interpret correctly Sodom and Gomorrah, you will have a problem with that. Do you get that? If you don't interpret correctly Sodom and Gomorrah, you will not have a problem with, with that. You will have a problem with what Jesus is saying here. So what kind of a spirit were they of? How were they called, James and John? The, the sons of what? Of thunder. The sons of thunder. Let's go to come down from heaven. Now, they were sent messengers to a village. The village rejected, and they came up with the idea, fire come down from the sky. What story in the Old Testament that sounds like? Two messengers into a, a particular village. They rejected those messages, and fire comes down from heaven. What story comes to mind? Solomon and Gomorrah. Is it very plain? So, I'll tell you what Jesus is saying here. Now, guys, this is the New Testament now. The rules have changed. No. Guys, calm down. You, you, you're reading far too much the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. I know that I say of myself also in the Old Testament that I changed not. But um, oh look, it was towards the end of the Old Testament, not towards the beginning. In the Old Testament, it was okay. But you in the New Testament is not okay. Does that sound like bipolar to you? Okay. All right. Do you know not what made of a spirit you are of? For the Son of Man is to destroy men's life, but to save them. And they went to another village. In the Isaiah of Ages says the following. There can be no more conclusive, conclusive evidence that we possess the spirit of Satan than the disposition to hurt and destroy those who do not appreciate our work or who act contrary to our ideas. Huh. Sodom and Gomorrah, you, you act contrary to my ideas? Don't worry. Come on. What does that sound like? Like God? The one that is not willing that anybody will perish, but he will wait until the last one has made the decision? The last one that will make the decision. Will make the decision? Okay. So the first book of the Bible is the book of? Job. And in the first chapter... Of the first book of the Bible, the great controversy is introduced. And the first reference, first reference to the first book of the Bible, in the first chapter of the Bible of fire coming down from heaven, is in the book of Job. And it says this, when all this is being taken away from Job, and all the destruction came, the different servants, coming and tell, telling, telling Job the story, what was happening. And in verse 16 of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, prepares us for, to realize of the great controversy, says, while he, the previous servant, was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consume them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Question, friends. Who made, who was capable, who actually moved the forces of nature, who had kind of a power to a degree to actually bring fire out of the sky and consume those those animals. 
Is the same chapter fairly clear on that idea? Yes or not? In order for Satan to do so, he needed something for God to do. What did God have to do? He had to walk away. He had to remove his protection. He had to think out his layer of protection. You think, hold on a second, hold on a second. But Job didn't reject God. Yeah, that's okay. No problem. Because one thing is certain. That for the sinner, it is not a good idea that God removes your protection. But for the righteous... Because the righteous has the right image of God. He knows that whatever comes my way, I am hidden with, in, uh, with Christ in God. Whatever comes my way, I take it as if it comes from God. In fact, the Spirit of Prophecy says this, The Father's glory encircle Christ, and nothing could befall Him except what divine love allowed to come his way. That was his source of comfort, and it was also to us. Nobody could touch Christ until Gethsemane. Nobody. They were trying to throw him down a cliff, and nobody could touch him. He would walk through the middle. Nobody could touch Christ. He understood that every criticism, everything that they said about them, any, any, any attempt that happened to any, any temptation, whatever, was allowed by the Father For his comfort, and that was the source of comfort. So for the righteous, bring it on. It doesn't change God. My circumstances do not change God. My wife is sleeping in Christ. That doesn't change God. I've been lonely, people say. My question is to you, are you lonely? No, because there's a difference. You might be feeling lonely, but are you lonely? No. no. Why not? Because he says he will never leave you, never forsake you. So my circumstances do not change God. God is still God despite of my circumstances. And, and what is God inviting me to do? He's inviting me to live by faith on what he says about me, not what I feel about myself. What he says that is for me, know what I look with my eyes. Do you catch that? And besides that, when the enemy touches me, when the enemy touches me, I need to seek the Lord even further. And I need to ask the Lord this question. Lord, the enemy is touching me. If this is just a test of my faith, that's fine, I'll take it. But if I have something of the enemy in me, I don't want to be a thief. If it belongs to him, I'll give it back. In chapter 3 of the book of Job, Job said the following in regards to the, dest the destruction of all his property, destruction of all his children, and destruction of his health. He says this in the book of Job, chapter 3. He says, The very thing that I feared the most that has come upon me. And God goes and says, hold on a second, hold on a second. Did I hear that right? Because I didn't give you fear. So it must be coming from someone else. And that someone else might be demanding whatever you're stealing from him. Give the fear to him because the demons believe in God and tremble. They own the fear. Give it to them. I'll give you my peace. Amen. There you go, refining. So, if we are Christians, if we are part of the righteous and tribulation come our way, bring it on. Because trust in the Lord despite tribulation. How else would you go through the great tribulation if you don't have that set in your mind? Do you think that the devil can be vicious and invent new thoughts? How would you endure torture if you don't have clear in your mind that whatever, whatever, bring it on, whatever. God doesn't change. God is good. But the evil that is happening to you, doesn't matter. 
What is happening to us is totally irrelevant. He, his character, his name, his good, and it's good forever, and it changes not. And that is manifested in the way I react on tribulation. That's what it stands. His glory, not my physical salvation. Oh, Lord, I feel like it doesn't matter how I feel. It only matters what do you say, Father. Okay, so that's the book of Job. Now, first occasion, fire came down from the sky, and he brought, who, who brought that? Satan, first book of the Bible, friends, gives us a great controversy. You need, to, you need to hear the second presentation. If you didn't, you need to hear the second presentation. So, we got Sodom and Gomorrah, messages are sent to the town, but before that, or as they go into the town, have you noticed something? Have you noticed Abraham talking to God and saying, um, <clears throat> um, so is it, is it 50, you, you still destroy it? Uh, if it's 50, no. Or if it's 25, if it's 25, no. And what about if it's 10? If it's 10, if it's 10 no. You, you'll think, okay, Abraham, why you didn't go down to one, you know? Now, I don't know if you realize, I want to talk to my friends, the atheists, that will be watching there. I don't know, my friend atheists, but you... I hope you, you appreciate the fact that the, the reason why is some 50 righteous down on this earth. <laughs> That's the reason. There's enough of God's mercy present. But when Job takes his two daughters because everyone else rejected, they are taken by the angels away and fire comes down from the sky and consumes them. Where is now God's protection? He's gone with Job and the two daughters. Oh, sorry, with Job. With Lot and the two daughters. That's where God's protection is going. Did they get consumed? No. You know? And they were, they were not that far from that city. Have you ever been close to a big, big fire? That thing is hot even, even, even kilometers away. So they went out. <laughs> eh? Oh, 10 minutes. Okay, this one might be a little bit like 10 minutes and a little bit more, okay? I've got 10 minutes and a little bit more, please. Okay, the wrath of God. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Friends, we need to show Him, all Him. And all him is beautiful. All him is beautiful. Do you know that we cannot go to the dictionary to figure out what destruction under the hand of God means, that we need to go to the Bible to figure that out? And do you know that we, need, we cannot go to the dictionary to figure out what the wrath of God is? We need to go to the Bible to figure it out? And do you know that the Bible actually outlines what the wrath of God is almost to the tick by definition? You know, okay, if I tell you, when John saw in 1 John chapter 29, when he saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Okay, who does the Lamb represent? Christ. Okay, that is actually a definition. John is actually giving us a, a, a definition of a concept. He's putting, in the, he's putting in the same context the Lamb and Christ. So we know that now when we look at the Old Testament, when you, when you will see a Lamb in the century, who are we seeing? Christ. He's a sign, sign of Christ. See? Because it's a definition by putting in the same context the two things that are explained, explaining each, each other. Right? Okay. The wrath of God is actually found in the Scriptures. It's Romans 1.18. He tells us the following. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and righteousness. Okay, so Romans 1.18 tells us the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, okay, against all the works of unrighteousness and ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, okay? And then 
from 18 onwards, the first thing that he does is describes what are those words of unrighteousness, and then he tells us how is the wrath revealed. Did you catch it? Okay, so we'll go through the list. It's no, you, you, can, you can corroborate it with your verses and just put the verse numbers there. Verse 19, so what are the words of ungodliness and unrighteousness of men? The wrath of God is going to be revealed against. They are the following. God has shown himself, however, even in the invisible things of creation, men are without excuse because God has actually shown himself. Then it says, verse 21, because, uh, became unthankful, full of vain imaginations, foolish and darkened heart, presumptuous and foolish in verse 22. Verse 23, he outlines worshippers rather than the creator. Verse 24, hearts full of lust, dishonoring of their own bodies. This is this some, some of the words of ungodliness and unrighteousness. Okay? Verse 25, turn of God's truth into lies. Idol worshippers, vile affections, sexual immorality, against nature. Uh, and that is against nature, like physical nature, and against nature, human nature. More, more sexual immorality, in verse 27, reaping consequences of their errors. Uh, they do not retain, and they don't want God. Not as that. They don't retain God, they don't want Him. The principle of love in God, as proceeds from God, is God embedded in that principle that the, the freedom of choice. And everybody that gets to heaven is because they love Him, not because they force there. And God will not force anybody. If you want to be lost, He will let you be lost. Fornication, wickedness, uh, envy, murder, debate. Oh, debate. Sorry. <laughs> Deceit, malignancy, whispers. Oh, that one. It's amazing, isn't it? Because we, we look at the big ones, you know, and then uh, just go through, through your list, okay? <laughs> Backbiters, haters of God, the spiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. So you're talking about you and your father, right? You're not talking about your children towards you. As I said, make your own list. 31, without understanding covenant breakers or promise breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. When he says unmerciful, what is it? They offer you no protection. When you are around them, watch out. Even having pleasure in doing such things. These are what? The works of unrighteousness and ungodliness. To against the wrath of God is being revealed. So in the same context, Romans 1 tells us what is the wrath of God. Are you ready? You better be ready because the wrath of God is all throughout the scripture and at the end we have the wrath of God falling on us. Or at least on the unrighteous. So how the wrath of God is revealed against these things? Verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Verse 26. God gave them up and to vile affections, the desires of their hearts, God gave them up to receive in themselves that recompense of their error. Verse 28, God gave them up. God gave them over to a re reproved mind. Friends, what is the Bible, not the dictionary, definition of the wrath of God? God gave them up. But that was not a unilateral giving away. God does not initiate the giving them up. God is not even invited to step back. God is being looked upon and said, we despise you. You told us that you love us and that we have freedom of choice. We don't want you to save us. 
And when a person comes to a position in which he doesn't want to be saved by God, what, how can God save them? He will need to break his love. And friends, I've seen it. I've seen people dying. And you go there and you go, man, you're praying for a thief on the cross experience. And the guy is just kicking you out of the room. How can God save him? You know what he's actually experiencing right there? The wrath of God. Did you catch that? Is that clear? Okay, so, so it's clear for a few people. Can I see a show of hands? Is that clear? Now, with that in mind, I want you to notice that this. Let me see that one. Yeah. The sin of the people rose up, and, and because of the iniquity of the people, the Lord poured out the vials of his wrath. So, what did he do? He let them out. He removed all his protection. He walked away. The fearful doom of Sodom. And it stands forth as a warning for all time, and especially for those who live in the last days. What actually happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, friends, is actually a picture for these days. And it says, the destruction of Sodom was a symbol of the destruction that will come upon the finally impenitent. Finally impenitent. When tempests of fire come from above, and notice, just like in the flood, the waters came from above and from below, and fountains of flame break forth from the crust of the earth, the faith of this ancient city should be a warning to all who live for self. If you live for self, do you have God protecting you? No. If you, if you live for self, um, do you have God as your companion in the journey? No. Like He's there, at, but at a distance. He, he's even there, you, you know. Your sins have hidden your face from Him. And who corrupt their ways before God, the sin of Sodom is the sin of many cities now in, in, in existence that have not been destroyed as was Solomon. Sodom. Sorry. Sodom. That was not destroyed as was Sodom. Now, place where God will permit the destroyer, which is called what? The wrath of God. To work His will upon it. That's from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7. This earth has... Now, can I show off God? <laughs> I can show Him off. Can you put any blame on Him? No. No. What else can he do except love you to your ultimate consequence? Oh, it says zero. So did, it, did, you just, did you just run out of time now or I've been talking an extra 10 minutes? Just now? Almost, that, almost now? Oh, fantastic. Praise God because I was trying. I really need to finish this presentation. So we're all ready for the worst that is coming in the last one. The worst for whom? Satan. For Satan. It gets worse for him. Because as the character of God is being revealed, his character too is exposed. Okay, let me, ha let me have a look at a show of hands. How many of you had had like a Emmaus experience only just through this presentation and your hearts were like, huh? It's like we put like the loving Savior and we put it in a, the past and a, huh. How many of you had like, huh, experience? Can I see your hands? Praise God. Friend, my atheist friend, if you've gone this far, you have watched already six presentations. I hope you have. The same ah, experience. God loves you. He's desperate for you.
Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, because the wrath of God will not fall upon your children because you will never leave us, never forsake us, even through tribulation. I'm thankful, Father, that you have such a beautiful respect for humanity, that your love and your mannerism and your, and your way of doing things are of a much higher caliber. I thank you, Father, because you change not. And I thank you, Lord, for the blessing that the life ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, as he manifested the character of the Father, has been to the church and now ought to be to the world. If Jesus is presented in the proper light and he is lifted up above human tradition and human uh, interpretations, if the beautiful character of God is high and lifted up, you will draw everyone to yourself. Let that is, 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 is scripture be fully completed. We pray all this in Jesus' holy and precious name.